Hello, everyone. Thank you for your patience and welcome to the webinar titled Combining Patient Records, Genomic Data, and Environmental Data to Enable Translational Medicine, presented by Proficient's Healthcare Strategist Martin Sizemore and Mike Grossman, who is the Director of Clinical Data Warehousing and Analytics in Proficient's Life Sciences Practice. My name is Eugene Stefanoff. I am the Marketing Manager for Proficient's Life Sciences Practice. Before I turn it over to Martin and Mike, I'd like to cover some basic housekeeping items and then provide a brief overview of Proficient. All participants on this call will be in listen-only mode. Uh, this means that all of you are on mute. You can submit questions to Martin and Mike at any time today by typing your questions in the chat feature, which is located on the left side of your screen. Please do make sure you state your questions clearly, and keep in mind that other webinar participants will not see your questions or comments. Your questions to the speaker will be anonymously addressed as time allows towards the end of the presentation. Uh, if you do have unanswered questions after the webinar or would like to request information about our services, you can contact us via the forms on the website. You can also utilize the contact information that is presented in the webinar. Please note that today's webinar is being recorded, and it will be sent to you within several days along with a link to the PDF version of the presentation. So now that we've covered the logistics, let's move on to a quick overview of Proficient. Proficient is an IT consulting company that offers a whole host of IT solutions for a variety of industries, including, of course, life sciences and healthcare as well as financial services, consumer products, insurance, and many others. We have offices and employees all over the world, including the ones you see on this slide. And as you may expect, most of our clients are from North America and Europe. This slide right here contains a bunch of facts, just to point out a few. We were founded in 1997. We are listed on the NASDAQ. And uh, at the moment, we have a little over 2,000 employees. We are an Oracle Platinum provider. We, our relationship uh, is a little over 12 years long. We've had hundreds and hundreds of implementations across the healthcare and life sciences space. We have well over 200 consultants that are located onshore here in the U.S. and in Europe, as well as offshore. And since this is a healthcare and life sciences focused webinar, I'll go ahead and, long, I'll go ahead and uh, speak to uh, these two practices. So Proficient provides a number of healthcare solutions to help organizations address all types of challenges that are found uh, in this industry. For example, business intelligence and analytics for population health management, uh, connected health for patient and member engagement, and the uh, interoperability to improve the coordination of care. Our life sciences practice has four separate divisions, uh, including clinical trial management, data management and EDC, safety and pharmacovigilance, as well as data warehousing and analytics. We specialize in the implementation and cloud hosting, the integration and use of a variety of applications, uh, many of which you see on this slide. We also offer a number of industry tools and accelerators that complement uh, these off-the-shelf systems. And we also have uh, custom development application services that we provide to our clients. Uh, aside from this right here, the Life Sciences team also works with other groups at Proficient to provide clients with services that aren't necessarily specific to clinical or safety applications, but instead are related to other areas of business 
uh, within a life sciences company. And with that, um, I'd now like to pass it over to Martin and Mike to introduce themselves and begin the presentation. Thank you very much, Eugene. Uh, my name is Martin Sizemore. I'm the principal of the healthcare vertical. I'm a strategist. I work with a lot of our uh, C-level uh, customers, both payers and providers. I am by training an enterprise architect, and I have a special interest in clinical data warehousing, data models, and healthcare business intelligence. And I'm very excited to be talking about today's topic with you because I think it's an exciting development in our healthcare and life science industries. So I'll let Mike introduce himself. Thanks, Martin. Uh, my name is Mike Grossman. I run the practice for clinical warehousing analytics in our life sciences business unit. Um, I've been at this a long time in various uh, roles. I've spent over 10 years at Oracle as a product strategist, an architect, um, and basically I fun focus on everything in the life sciences industry that happens during clinical research after the data is captured. And I also work with academic medical centers as well as other healthcare uh, facilities to really make that bridge between research that's happening at life sciences and research that's happening in mac academic medical centers with focus on biomarker and genomics data, which is what I'll be talking to you about today. So with that, I will pass it back to Martin, and then he can start with the presentation, and I'll be speaking to you later in the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I'm looking forward to uh, I agree with Mike. I think uh, what happens a lot of times is the interesting things happen in life when you combine two different sub big subject areas like healthcare and life science. And uh, to answer this question of what is translational medicine, uh, you know, one of the things that happens there is you hear a lot of different terms. You hear bench to bedside. You hear precision medicine. Uh, but I want to I kind of zero in on a key idea, which is the idea of targeted therapies that, you know, are very specific in addressing a single patient's illness through, you know, really these specialized therapies and expanding our knowledge around that patient in a fully customized way. Uh, we've been fortunate that advances in basic molecular science are paving the way for us to look at these targeted therapies and address the unique biological mechanisms inside of an individual patient's illness. And you may even hear them talked about in the press as things called biomarkers. And the, the, the production of these, these proteins or biomarkers from your RNA is really unique, as Mike has educated me, from person to person. And through advanced analytics, we can locate these specific variations and begin to tailor therapies for an individual. Ultimately, that's where we get the idea of it becoming personalized, where we can allow for a, what I would call a fully customized approach to healthcare that takes into account an individual patient's medical history, their disease risk, their individual pathology, and then selects the most promising course of treatment based on their unique characteristics. There was a time when that vision would seem like it was a long way off. We don't think it is today because we're under a lot of pressure to translate scientific advances in molecular biology into targeted therapies, especially in the treatment of cancer or tailoring medications for children, you know, for safety. There's a growing trend in the United States by large healthcare organizations to set up and establish these translational medicine research centers, particularly in academic medicine, as Mike pointed out. Our goal in today's session is really to discuss kind of taking that sometimes disjointed bench to bedside work and organizing it for success using advanced analytics and using some, some very nice new ideas about architectures to accomplish this. So why is a new approach needed? I mean, you know, we all hear in the press, our current clinical trial and drug regulatory process, it's slow, it's laggy, 
The research is there. Why can't we translate it into results? The process is, is stretches over too many years and tens of millions of dollars, and people have immediate needs to have illnesses addressed. Part of this is because large phase three trials for drugs, for example, continue to be a major cost driver. And so, you know, we can gain efficiencies in this particular stage. Now, that does not look past the regulatory needs or regulatory uncertainty or tight margins or sometimes the high risk of failure that keeps us from doing experimentation in this space. But many people have suggested that novel clinical trial designs could capitalize on our growing knowledge of patient subpopulations, which we call cohorts. We can identify these patient subpopulations, target a therapy to them without compromising FDA's rigorous safety standards. Many people in the healthcare business are very optimistic that combining healthcare and life sciences can help get a cost-effective delivery of innovative therapies to patients, especially those who are predispositioned to respond favorably. One of the most promising areas for this investigation that we, we mentioned earlier, which is oncology. Today we recognize that cancer is an incredibly diverse group of diseases that almost defies a single label. But tailoring chemotherapy to the highest efficacy for an individual's biomarkers or a group of individuals with matching genomic or proteomic profiles is a perfect example of a novel clinical trial design that can speed up saving lives. So at this point, you're probably asking yourself, okay, how do we get started? You mentioned earlier that there's a few problems with, you know, this picture that we see here, silos, right? You know, and so there are definite challenges to locating those patients that would be ideal for a targeted clinical trial. More importantly, in order, the amount of data that we have to manage, the scale of that data needs to be examined. Second, there are system interoperability issues with electronic medical record software. You've seen it in the press. You know, this system doesn't talk to that system, and they don't share the right level of information across all of the care settings before we even start connecting molecular biology to it. However, the demand to evolve traditional care models has never been greater, and the speed of knowledge delivery needs to begin to match. And that's really what we want to address. It starts with a simple idea of integrating what we call the longitudinal record of a patient from multiple electronic medical record systems. And what that means in plain English is connecting the records in the hospital with the records out in the doctor's offices, with the laboratory, with all the different components around that particular patient. This information could be about medications, for example, dosing, frequency, adverse reactions. All of those need to be compiled into an enterprise data warehouse. The patient record then, and this is the key part, needs to be extended to encompass the oncology, tumor profiling, residual disease testing, and other aspects of the genomic and proteomic space in order to get a progression analysis around the disease. The key to success is, is really the plan for this volume of data, the velocity, and the types of data that need to be built out and then consumed. With healthcare focused on outcomes and costs right now, there's a number of data sources that need to be integrated into the whole and then a need to kind of blend the big data of genomics and proteomics in the right manner, but under the control of governance. One of the other keys to success is this ability, and you're going to see Mike talk about this later, to create these population subgroups or cohorts with these patients to where they're de-identified in order to qualify for tailored clinical trials and to meet regulatory requirements. It's these smaller targeted groups that will help reduce or limit the scope of attaching sequencing data and other large data sets and helps us get our arms around this where do we start challenge. Let's take a look in this next slide at kind of a long-term reference architecture 
you know, what it might look like to address these challenges. Keeping in mind when I show you this picture that these architectures are modular, they're built in parts to systematically reach the goals. Okay, I told you there were a lot of puzzle pieces. But, you know, it, it's, it's the old problem of starting with the end in mind. What we want to do is we want to look at a long-term reference architecture that is key to addressing the roadblocks to getting to this clinical application of genomics and proteomics, for example. Test data, for example, in, in healthcare and in life sciences comes from lots of sources. They're not always easy to work with. Sometimes you can't query them. They're raw, they're unstructured, they're large binary vials. There's also the challenge of time to data and time to result. You know, we gotta get the results right now. This, this cancer patient could die immediately. So we're under a lot of pressure to clean the data, structure the data, but get answers right away. What you see with this particular architecture is the idea that moving from the left to right, that you kind of start with the sources and using best practices, you then normalize that data, you standardize the vocabularies, you move it into data warehouses, traditional ones, but you extend those data warehouses with data hubs and big data, and in some cases, even streaming data that's coming directly from laboratory equipment. And then you combine that with traditional business intelligence, master data management, and, and, and in this, the bottom one, very important, metadata management. The idea that I know where the data come from and can I trace all the way back to its origin so that I can test its quality, I can make sure that I'm working with the most trustworthy data for decisions. Keep in mind that a lot of times we're working with physicians who are evidence-based individuals, and when they question something, they need to be able to go back to the source in order to understand the veracity of it. It's possible to integrate this large number of data sources and normalize them in order to consume them. It, it is a big task. It has to be taken in chunks. But what it will do is it will meet the accuracy and the trustworthiness of the data that you need in order to look at these patients across the continuum of care and even within their own individual biology. So let's drill down for a second, and let's look at the importance of this data normalization thing, because it's, it's a hot topic in order to create this bridge. And so, you know, you've heard of these different systems. You know, EPIC is very popular, Cerner, GE, Centricity, Lawson. I just pick some. You know, and by the way, the average hospital has somewhere between 20 and 200 of these source systems, some of which are eligible to contribute data, and some of which are not. But the, that shows you a bit of the challenge of integrating the data and how important that reconciliation of the various vocabularies within data is to solving this particular problem. Uh, the other thing that happens is, and you're going to see us talk about this in a minute, is we not only need to integrate data within the context of healthcare and life sciences and translational medicine centers, but we need to take into account the broader vision, the holistic view of the patient the environmental issues, you know, the exposure to air pollution, pesticides, and that kind of thing. And so we, this is an ongoing process of integrating data and having a methodology for integrating data, creating these data marts. And I can't for a minute uh, under, overemphasize how important data marts are. And the reason is because we're dealing with interactional information here about a patient. We need to know where did the care take place? What time did it happen? What labs were done? And a lot of other dimensions, including that external data, that gives us all the different views of, of that particular patient in order to see if they qualify for a clinical trial or if they're proceeding you know, properly through the process. And so, you know, one of the stories I like to tell is, you know, if, if a cancer patient falls down and breaks their leg and they, they go to an orthopedic and they don't go back to the hospital where they're getting chemotherapy, how do we tie that together to see if one had anything to do with the other? And so it's very important that we get this, this integration going. Last but not least, on the far right side, the reporting and analytics today sometimes gets glossed over. I joke a lot that, you know, Excel is the number one BI tool. 
because you know people think that that's really the end all be all for dashboards. But the truth is today we, we've got better tools than we've ever had to visualize data and to guide action and decision making and to be able to highlight key points with heat maps and other views to quickly identify opportunities or identify these subpopulations we want to work with. So it's a real value in building this out. You're going to hear Mike talk a little bit more about EHA and the importance of the data model because the data model is, is where we bring things, we stage things, and we reconcile those vocabularies. So what about external data? How important is external data in translational medicine? You know, um, there's a lot of Americans who have asthma. I think it's, in fact, it's, uh, it's a fast-increasing disease in our country, uh, particularly in children. It's, it's terrible in foreign countries. Uh, most of you have probably seen Mexico City and some of this picture here, which is from Beijing. But it's, it's a debilitating condition, asthma is, it has no cure. And I think that the challenge is if we can map geographic information, if we can map air, air pollution information and combine it with that internal data about the patient, including their biomarkers, then we can run trials to see, you know, what we can do to address some of those issues. We can also use it in a predictive way, okay, to determine, you know, are we increasing the size of that population and what can we do to, you know, get a better handle on it, reduce costs, and reduce the human suffering involved. You know, it's, it's funny. In fact, it's not funny. In, in one recent Los Angeles study here, 8% of childhood asthma cases were a result of simply living within 250 feet of a major roadway. And that's the kind of thing that we need to take into account in this complete view of the patient as we approach this integrated or translational medicine view. So where we, where we want to kick off today is we want to kick off this idea of an integrate, this integration, integrated solution or an integration solution. And what we want to share is a great example of an integrated solution for enabling that kind of long-term reference architecture that I went through with you and extending traditional business intelligence models or solutions into these targeted clinical trials, including personalized medicine. And Mike's going to guide you on Oracle's healthcare data model, EHA, and how it can, can be combined with this omics data to enable addressing the business problems that I've outlined for you today. So, Mike, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you explain. Uh, thanks for that, Martin. I appreciate that. So, uh, as Martin has discussed the idea of a reference data model, what I really want to talk to you about is, from a tactical, pragmatic standpoint, how can you implement an architecture like this? And what are the key considerations that you have to put into place to actually successfully roll out an architecture like this? Um, in this particular uh, slide, we see that essentially those little squares over under analytic data, master data, and omics data are essentially logical subjects or logical domains of how you want to break up your data independent of the source. So the idea is that you have this reference data model that's ready to go, and then you can break things up into those sources. And in fact, that actually has the personally identifiable information. But if you're going to use this data for research, that personally identifiable information really is not necessary for the researchers to know that. So that needs to go through an anonymizer. And then the data marts for, for uh, cross-patient analysis really need to be kept separate. But if you're actually treating patients on an individual case, you need that PHI in there. So it's all part of this reference architecture. So some of the, really, what are some of the key considerations that we have here? So, First of all, should you invent your own reference architecture? Um, Oracle's Enterprise Healthcare Analytics is an example of a predefined data model. There are other data models out there, um, but my strong recommendation is that you start with a pre-existing data model and that as an individual research institution, um, whether you be on the life sciences side, the AMC side, or, or, or a hospital, you don't try and invent a data model. Because if you're inventing your own data model, you're spending a lot of money, a lot of cycles, a lot of resources, about something that's already really been proven out by a number of companies and a number of customers. Um, 
one of the other things is as you're bringing all the data together, everybody's going to have to talk the same language. And when I talk about language, I'm really talking about terminology for things like diagnoses, uh, for things like procedures, for lab tests. Uh, many facilities are actually uh, moving to ICD-10. A lot of, uh, a lot of um, facilities are using ICD-9. It doesn't actually matter which one you use, but you need to agree that you're going to speak, when you're dealing with this data, you're going to speak a common language and have a common set of vocabularies to work with. Very important before you even get started that that be um, agreed upon. And then as you move, as these vocabularies change and move forward over time, um, they can all be moved together. The next thing is you can't do this all at once. Um, if you try and cover all the domains or cover your entire EMR system all in an initial release, your project will fail. You need to actually start with specific selected areas about what you're interested in, like encounters and complaints, and, uh, along with maybe some genomics and proteomics, um, and you know, put together some ideas about what kind of questions you want to add, ask, and then you can add more and more topics as time goes by. And everybody really has done some type of research in this space before. Typically it's done on one-off study cases and maybe someone has a big Unix workstation under their desk and they pulled their genomics data together with very, very specific phenotypic data. Um, you really want to have some data marts ready for that and not everybody building their own custom data mart. Again, the idea is we would want to build a reference architecture that can be used over and over again so that each one of your study teams, each one of your research um, studies is not a separate invention. In the life sciences side, this has been achieved um, with electronic data capture systems followed by CDESC. On the healthcare side with EMRs, the standards really have not achieved the same level of conformity and the same level of production repeatability. The idea really is that we'd like to, at least within a facility, even if it's uh, many different um, hospitals within a facility or a network of facilities, that there's some agreement in place that you can get that data structured. The next area I'd like to discuss is the role of proteomics, genomics, um, biomarker data um, in, in, in the role of personalization. So right now, if you could just get together all your phenotypic data, all your clinical data, and combine it with environmental data, that would be extremely useful. So if you truly want to talk about tr personalizing and customizing the treatment of individual patients, we really have to understand, based on their genomic profile of the individual patients, what exactly is the most effective treatment. And when you're looking for patterns in the genomic data, we really have to understand are there certain variants that can really improve the targeting of specific patient populations. So when you start a project like this, you really want to understand what is the current policy and approach on how samples are taken and stored. So if you're already collecting samples and you've got some, some bio bank or you've got some sample banks, um, you want to take advantage of those existing approaches. Don't start from scratch. There's a lot of silos of information. The goal is not to reinvent this stuff. It's to bring the silos together. Another thing that I think is often overlooked is that very often, we're actually sending samples out to external labs or we have internal labs where we're um, getting biomarker results. And we take these pathology results and we might take them on an individual patient basis and put them back against the electronic medical record as a PDF file or as an image. And that allows the individual um, caregiver to actually make medical decisions about that one subject or that one patient. But what typically is not happening is that those pathology results and those biomarker results that have been curated beyond the sample are actually available to aggregate across patients. So instead of an unstructured PDF or image that goes against the patient record, there's no real way to look across them. So when we talk about omic samples and analyzing genomics, proteomics, it's not just about the raw samples and looking through those. It's about taking our lab results and our pathology results and making those structured and making those searchable. Because a lot of curation occurs on that data. And it's very important that the curated data with the comments and the decisions about what's meaningful and what's not meaningful are not lost because that knowledge that's in the pathology lab result is incredibly important in deciding the value. So it's, very, it's all well and good to have raw samples and be able to look through variations on raw samples, but do not underestimate the ability to link those raw samples to the actual curated pathology results.
Now, as you're building out one of these translational research centers and you're linking it to the genomics data, how do we link the information? Now, it is clear, and it's particularly sensitive with genomics data, that that can reveal personally identifiable information. So you really need to be careful when moving into a project like this that you actually are very prospective and understanding about who needs to see what data and when, and if somebody doesn't need to see certain data, that they do not have access to that data. So what are the processes, procedures, controls that you need to put into place for the research data so that it doesn't compromise PHI? How have you handled that in the past? Do you have an IRB that's already done this? Do you have informed consent um, that happens for every subject as they, as they are administered into the hospital, or is it done on a study-by-study -study basis? So these are processes and procedures that has to be put in place in parallel with putting in an IT infrastructure because otherwise you'll end up with an empty warehouse that nobody can use because you don't have rich enough data to actually find patterns in this. And some hospitals have actually been um, having a general informed consent that when they take samples that they can actually use that sample for research purposes in an anonymous fashion for all subjects that come, come through. And it's more of an opt-out, whereas other hospitals and other AMCs are really having an opt-in approach. So this is a very important topic, and if it, you can't cope with this, it can stall your project out in a very serious way. So you really need to do this upfront and in parallel with your IT implementation. The next thing is that what are your sources for omics and sample data? Um, there's a ton of different formats, a ton of different machines. You have internal labs. Are you dealing with external labs? Are there intellectual property issues with having external labs take the data and being used, having that data being used for other research other than its original intent? Um, how will you physically get the data, files is the most common, from your external labs into a system like this? Because typically these types of um, omics data are not available within the EMRs themselves. And they are, in fact, available as separate studies. So the idea is we want to bring this omics data into the reference architecture and link it up with the EMR data as well as the environmental data so we can have a true longitudinal view of the patient as well as we can identify what cohorts they would most likely be involved with. Now, when looking for uh, particular genomic profiles and particular variants, it's important that you actually identify what are you going to compare it to. There are a number of reference um, organizations out there, um, and when you're looking for variants, you're not going to invent all that stuff yourself. There's giant databases of mutation analysis, um, SNP databases. I'm just listing some of them in this slide. But what's really critical is that you do agree on what references you're going to use. You can have consistency across your analysis from one place to another. And certainly it's possible to support many reference variants uh, but really you need to build a methodology around your research um, that can be communicated to the affiliates and to anybody who's doing research so that there's some design pattern. And again, people are not reinventing how they do research. They're really focusing on the research themselves. Now, once we have all this data in and available in data marks, how do we cope with it? And it really is a very iterative process we really have a question to create a cohort. So I'm looking for women that have a certain variant and they're between a certain age group and they have certain biomarkers and they are diagnosed with breast cancer. And that will actually bring a subset of patients or a cohort of patients. Now we can start looking at various hypotheses. If we could look across their clinical record and say, well, what other phenotypic um, um, characteristics are they showing? What procedures have been formed on them? What type of radiology have they, have they had? What type of therapies have they had? What kind of drugs are they on? What is some of their patient history? What are some of the environmental um, capabilities? So if you were asked to do a study like that and you didn't have this type of reference architecture, essentially what you'd have to do is go get data from part A, go get data from part B, pull it into an access database, pull it into uh, a local database. Maybe you'd use SAS, maybe you'd use S+. Plus. And you would do that study and you'd come up with a publishable result. Okay, then the next person comes up and they have a different disease, different set of biomarkers, different type of environmental data, and different type of phenotypic data that they need from the EMR. 
they are going to go through exactly the same process and they're going to do it from scratch because it's different data and different sources. The idea is we want to productionalize the process of doing the research. What you want to do, get your cohort, put a hypothesis together, pull the longitudinal data out so the full patient record, including environmental data, EMR data, as well as the omics data, and then pull that into an analytical tool such as S Plus or SAS or something like that and do some model building. Then you bring the results of that back in and you iterate around. Now, if you're finding patterns in the actual methods, the analytical methods that are being used, an example of common analytical methods are for a project like OMA. Um, OMOP actually has published methods about how to analyze certain types of data. You may build up this library and you want to use it over and over and share it with your entire community and not have everybody working in their own silo. The next thing is once I have my analysis, what am I doing with the result? How am I storing the result? Am I just writing a paper? Do I have a place where I can take those cohorts and set them aside and say, look, this cohort I want to look at a different way or maybe a different researcher wants to look at it? You really have to plan out where are we going to put the results, where are we going to put the methods, and where are we going to identify those cohorts so other researchers can take advantage of it. The net result is your efficiency on conducting research, your ability to apply to uh, respond to grant applications, your ability to actually conduct the research efficiently goes way up if you have a systematic approach using reference architecture with all the considerations that I'm talking about. Now, again, you can't do this all at once. So what you need to do is you need to prioritize, are there a specific set of immediate drivers that you can use over the next six months, the next eight months, the next year to actually help you with prioritization? It's very important that you don't go into a project like this with just a two-year deliverable or an 18-month deliverable. You need to show business success each step of the way. And typically what we'll do is we'll sit down and we'll work out some use cases that are real either pain points or success points that you want to communicate to your business and really illustrate how putting an architecture like this um, can actually be very successful. And then other uh, members of your community would reach in, I need to do that, but I have this variation, and I need to do this, and I have this variation. Don't do it as a big bang. Take it as small, incremental steps, pulling the data together. I'm actually at a client site right now, and we're actually going through this process as we speak. So um, to conclude, really, we want to prioritize your data sources from a pragmatic um, standpoint for answering your key translational questions, whether they be environmental, omics, a combination, EMR, etc. Identify your reference data model and what tools you're going to actually use to build a production-level translational research center. Integrate your biomarker sample data with your clinical domains that have been defined perhaps for other purposes. And then you can add new domains as you go forward. You want to establish the rules for anonymization, de-identification. In addition, you may also have rules around intellectual property, particularly if you're working with third-party data. Um, so you may need to isolate those. That needs to be set up systematically and not ad hoc. Once you've normalized all your data, pull it through to analysis data marks that's specifically designed to be optimized for cohort analysis and research. Um, if you have standard methods for accessing those data marks, it will be very powerful. What we recommend is for cohort analysis, pulling your cohorts, use interactive query tools um, such as the, the Oracle Translational Research Center. Um, but then once you've identified your cohort, you may want to use S plus or R or SAS and have methods set aside to automatically pull all that data out of the data mark for that cohort and do deep analysis. Um, you may, if, as you see patterns, you may have predefined analytics dashboards. So for example, once you identify a cohort of patients uh, the raw genomics data, you may then want to have that automatically married to their um, lab results with all the comments and all the curation that's occurred. So a person can actually see all the analysis and commenting that's gone on their pathology report that's associated with that sample. In later phases, you can actually take the results and the method, and you can actually store those, and you can actually reuse those. Typically, that happens in a later phase after you've actually got all the data together and you start building out the analysis. And as a final point here, what I'd like to say is that uh, Proficient actually has expertise in all these areas of implementing a translational research center. 
whether it be the original business justification or the physical implementation, testing, and bringing to production of all these types of, um, of, of research and a translational, um, a translational type of projects. So we do have expertise both on the life sciences side and the healthcare side and can walk you through the entire process. So I think with that, um, that's the end of the formal presentation. Um, I think we're going to open it up for questions now and discussion. So with that, I'll hand it back to you, Eugene. Great. Thanks, Mike and Martin. Uh, so if you do have questions, feel free to ask away in the chat feature, which is uh, located on the left side of your screen. We'll give it about 30 seconds to see if we get any questions. And uh, in the meantime, I'll go ahead and put up the contact slide for, uh, for us. You can reach out to Martin or Mike Grossman. And it looks like we got our first question. What are some of the challenges of integrating popular electronic medical record systems like Epic or Cerner with other medical device, sorry, medical systems? Thanks, Eugene. Uh, I'll take that one. This is Martin. Um, the Epic and Cerner are, have focused on integrating their, their electronic medical record systems really with, within the different aspects of a hospital, for example, today, and not so much being able to connect with one another. And so they are making rapid progress because of a law called meeting Meaningful Use Stage 2 to share data uh, at more than just a transactional level. And so that we can pick up a lot of those transactions and including some newer XML you know, document formats to help get a complete, more complete view of a patient. Okay, thank you. Uh, so the next question is, what are some tools that make the integration of data into data warehouses and uh, data marts easier, including governance? It's, it's very important to have tools, you know, for example, tools that will let you do data discovery. And Oracle's got an excellent data discovery tool that lets you go in and introspect the data, look at it, and then determine how you want to manipulate it or do extract, transform, and load into a warehouse. And so having those data discovery tools to let you see the patterns of the data is one of the key things that makes that integration of data much, much easier. Okay, thank you. And the next question is, if we have Oracle Clinical as our clinical data management system, can it play a role as a data mart? Um, yeah, this, this is Mike. I'll, uh, I'll answer that one. Um, I actually used to be the product manager for Oracle Clinical um, when I worked at Oracle, so that, that, that's good. So, yeah, absolutely. So if you're actually using um, Oracle RDC or, or any, any other uh, company's EDC data and you have uh, essentially the, the structured uh, clinical data, um, such as Oracle Clinical, you can actually pull that stuff through the extract views. Now, typically there is a step of transformation that occurs before I would put it into a full reference architecture like this and where I would conform it to some sort of non-study specific structures such as CDISC SDPM. And that gives you an opportunity to reuse the analysis from study to study because on clinical trials, each data model is slightly different from one study to another. So we still would need to normalize and reuse that data. Um, Oracle has some products in that space, whether it be a life sciences data hub or um, Oracle EHA, um, but there are also other companies that have that. Now, once you've conformed that data to some sort of standard, you then have to look at, is there other data that isn't been captured with an Oracle Clinical that you want to combine with that? So, for example, were biomarker samples you know, taken during that and it's not part of your OC data? Do you have some external labs? Do you have some pharmacoeconomic data that you're trying to combine with that? Um, and you would bring that in, too, and you would actually do that modeling. So that works extremely well for, for life sciences companies. So, yes, the core clinical research data can come through Oracle Clinical, um, and we certainly know how to do that. But very typically, there's a lot more data than what you would just get to Oracle Clinical to do this type of translational research. Perfect, thanks. The next question is, has any work been done on 
inclusion of insurance claims information. I'm thinking about usefulness for cost modeling. I'll take that one, Eugene. Uh, yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, well, there, there's kind of two categories of claims. Uh, there's historical claims taken from Medicare, from like Center for Medicare and Medicaid, or CMS. Uh, those those are typically, you know, what we call post adjudicated, or they've been priced, and we can gather a lot of data. Yeah, and the challenge we get into a lot of times in these data models is combining that claims data with current clinical data because of the tremendous time lag between the two events. And uh, so, yes, there is work being done, and it is a good way to look at what we call risk, or risks within different populations and kind of stratifying populations based on uh, their, their disease states and costs and those kinds of things. And it's a precursor to uh, population health management. So, yeah, the, the, they're all very much related. Great, thanks. So we'll give it another 30 seconds to see if we have any more questions. doesn't look like we have any more questions. So if you do think so, uh, if you do come up with questions, uh, feel free to uh, contact Martin or Mike uh, via this information that you see here, or you can uh, fill out a form on Proficient's website. I'd like to let everyone know that we have numerous webinars that are coming up, and you can take a look at the schedule on our website. This webinar is being recorded, as you know, and it will be sent out within the next few days, hopefully sooner, along with the PDF version of today's slides. So I'd like to thank Martin and Mike for presenting today, and uh, I hope that everyone that attended found it very helpful. Thanks so much for joining, and have a great rest of the day and evening.